From the United Nations headquarters in New York, this is Disarmament Today. Hello everyone, my name is Gillian Goh. I am a Political Affairs Officer at the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs. It is my great pleasure today to speak with Dr. Jürgen Altman on the topic of nanotechnology. Allow me briefly, first of all, to introduce Dr. Altman. Dr. Altman uh, is a researcher and lecturer at the Technical University of Dortmund Physics and Disarmament Group. He is a physicist and peace researcher who has worked since 1985 on scientific technical problems of disarmament, in particular military technology assessment and preventive arms control, on one field of this being potential military applications of nanotechnology. Dr. Altman, welcome. Uh, Hello, everybody. (laughs) Dr. Altman, thank you so much for being here with us. Perhaps uh, we could start with some more general questions. Uh, Could you tell us, first of all, uh, what exactly is nanotechnology? Yeah, I'd like to start with the nanometer, which is a length unit. If one starts at a meter and then divides this by 1,000, one gets to a millimeter. A further factor of 1,000 down, one gets to a micrometer. And a third time, a factor of 1,000 smaller, one is at the scale of a nanometer. And any artificial structure that has dimensions, at least in one dimension, in the range of 1 to 100 of these nanometers, uh, one would like to call nanotechnology. There's also nanoscience. That's the scientific investigation of structures of this small size. But if we speak of nanotechnology proper, it's about artificial systems that humans have built or machines have built with structures, as I said, in the size range of 1 to 100 nanometers. So in this sense, it is not a field of technology. It's rather a length scale. Uh, With normal uh, mechanical machines, we do not call this meter or millimeter technology. Uh, So uh, nanotechnology is a very wide field, uh, which ranges from particles as small dots, so to speak, to fibers, to two-dimensional surface structures, up to complex three-dimensional structures, and it has many different applications. So when, when we talk about uh, nanotechnology, what are some of the areas of civilian application? Yeah, the closest at hand, which is already here, is structures in computer chips. So about 10 years ago, this threshold, which is by definition uh, of 100 nanometers uh, for when you start calling something nanotechnology, if you go below that, uh, the sizes of computer components in in chips, in memory units, uh, and in central processing units, CPUs, have gone below that threshold of 100 nanometers. So in one sense, modern computers are already examples of existing nanotechnology. There's the idea, and it has just started uh, to become workable, to have nanoparticles for delivery of therapeutic drugs to the body, where a nano-sized little, let's say, a sphere or a lengthy particle carries some therapeutic agent in it, in its inner volume, and because of its nano size, this nanoparticle can more easily pass through the blood-brain barrier, which is otherwise difficult for other therapeutic agents. And certain uh, nanoparticles or uh, solvents with uh, nano uh, uh, solutions with nanoparticles can act as disinfectant or decontaminant for whatever uh, poisons or uh, dangerous substances can clean up uh, 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 dirty water, etc. So there are quite a few 
possible civilian applications and the applications have just begun, I should say. So there are many more to come in the next 5, 10 and 15 years. That's very interesting. So which countries would you say are in the lead in nanotechnology research and development? Well, the highest developed countries or country blocks are doing more or less uh, uh, research at the same scale, so the U.S. on the one hand, the European Union on the other, or Japan, uh, they, uh, there we have governments that spend on the order of one billion dollars or euros wow. per year for, uh, for research and development of nanotechnology, but also countries such as China and Russia are very active, and there are quite a few threshold countries uh, such as uh, Brazil or India, uh, that have uh, nanotechnology research and development activities as well. So I would say the first three are probably the most advanced, mm -hmm. uh, and then it depends on the area which you look at whether the EU is leading or one of the EU, EU countries has uh, the lead in some of the nanotechnology area and uh, the U.S. in another and Japan in a third one. So, But all... Uh, in general, I would say these three blocks or countries are more or less on a par. Mm, I see. So just moving on now to uh, nanotechnology related to peace and security, what would you see are the potential military applications of nanotechnology? More than 10 years ago, I have written a book covering all the potential military applications of nanotechnology. And I have come up with some 20 areas. Uh, examples are, again, computing. Uh, other examples are materials, in particular, let's say, very strong but lightweight materials that could be used in aircraft. Certain materials in engines that would allow higher t uh, burning temperatures so that there is more power coming out of the engine. There is the possibility of having nanostructures, nano-sized powders in propellants and explosives. Mm. There's the area of sensors. There's the general area of vehicles, including combat vehicles. Uh, there's the possibility of having guidance systems on very small munitions, even not only in bigger missiles. Uh, there's the general idea of uh, miniature satellites that could be used for military purposes. One big area would be robots uh, for all kinds of purposes, including for fighting and uh, shooting. And there's the idea of soldier systems that either uh, are in, embedded into the combat suit to monitor the body functions from the outside, or there's also the idea to implant things in soldiers' bodies that either monitor body functions and apply through therapeutic agents as requested or as required, or uh, that have contacts to the nervous system, in particular the brain. And the final area that I'd like to mention is the one of new chemical biological agents that could be used as weapons. Uh, these are, of course, banned by the Chemical Weapons Convention mm -hmm. and by the Biological Weapons Convention, which have very general prohibitions. But nevertheless, there is, of course, the technical possibility of using new agents, and maybe we talk about this, uh, this danger uh, in a few minutes. Um, perhaps could I ask you to take us through maybe one or two or three of these? I think very interesting for our uh, listeners would be what you mentioned about chemical weapons. Could you just say a little bit more? Uh, yes, sure. Um, in particular, for biological agents, some of them or most of them are bacteria or viruses. They uh, proliferate in the environment and, uh, or in the human body or in animal bodies, and they are usually contagious. So if some person is affected and gets ill, it will exhaust or otherwise uh, stray around uh, further bacteria or further viruses and infect uh, other people. So for these biological agents, there's a certain hesitation on the part of the armed forces because there's always the possibility 
possibility of infecting one's own troop mm. or one's own population. However, uh, as the nanotechnology enabled advance in medical understanding and medical therapeutic possibilities progresses, there is the principal possibility to target certain agents. If you think of a cancer patient, one would very much like to have a chemical treatment that is not given systemically to the whole body and leads to all kinds of side effects, mm -hmm. but only have the toxic agent that kills the cells exactly in the cancerous organ or in the tumor. So uh, people are very actively looking at mechanisms to recognize cells that are tumor cells mm -hmm. and only release a toxic agent then when such a cell has been recognized in the immediate vicinity. However, if one better understands these mechanisms, of course, they could also be used for nefarious purposes. In, partic in, in, in principle, one could build an agent, maybe in 50 years, uh, that uh, recognizes certain specific traits in certain cells or in certain DNA patterns, in the uh, genetic patterns that is, uh, that is um, present in all, in all body cells, and only releases a toxin if a certain DNA pattern is uh, found. So this could be a relatively simple thing, such as red hair or blue eyes, mm. but in principle, uh, it is thinkable to have an agent that is trained, so to speak, or is being released only if the DNA pattern of one specific person is being seen by this little nano, nano agent. So you could give the same agent to 8 billion people on Earth and just one would uh, fall down dead or would be incapacitated somehow. Uh, if uh, this hinges on the possibility of being able to have in vivo DNA recognition, which is not yet here. Mm. And, but n by now you have to do it in vitro in the lab. So you deliver a blood sample, a saliva sample, whatever, and then uh, they extract the DNA and uh, do the multiplication and uh, try to understand the uh, components of that DNA. But if in vivo DNA recognition would be available, uh, this would open the, the mechanism that, that I just re described to react only on specific groups of people that carry a specific DNA pattern or even one specific person. So that's a very dangerous thing that I uh, see as possible, and uh, the international community should do much to try to prevent that being used for uh, military purposes. In particular, if it's targeted in such a way, it would remove much of the restraint that up to now is being felt towards biological agents because of the risk of self-infection uh, self, self of one's own troops or one's own population. Well, that's incredibly frightening. Um, let's say, could we ask you maybe about time frames? If we're saying that such technology might be available, who, do you think it's a near future or a far future scenario that we're looking at? Uh, the DNA in vivo recognition, I think, is medium to far future. Uh, but uh, targeted drugs that release a toxic substance if a certain uh, protein has been recognized that is typical of a cancerous cell exist already, at least in, in, in experiments, in animal experiments. So the general direction goes into this direction. Uh, the general development goes into this direction, and one has to make sure that the medical app applications are being researched and developed to fruition, while the potential nefarious uses are being blocked. As I said, the uh, Biological Weapons Convention mm -hmm. has a general prohibition of such uses, while it allows civilian uses, but unfortunately, there is a big gap in that this convention, other than the Chemical Weapons Convention, has no compliance and verification protocol to it. Um, so, Dr. Allman, do you think we are heading toward a nanotech arms race? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, 
in principle, as long as we have an international system where there is the so-called security dilemma, where there is no overarching political authority with the monopoly of legitimate violence that can uh, dictate rules how to deal with new technology and enforce them against perpetrators, as long we have such not such an overarching authority as in states. Uh, states feel insecure. They see the possibility of being attacked by aggressive other states. So they prepare their military forces. They strengthen them. But it's very difficult to strengthen only the, def the defensive mode of these. They, if you strengthen armed forces, normally you increase also the uh, offensive possibilities of mm -hmm. these armed forces. So if we look at the international system from above, we see all kinds of states that in order to make themselves secure against attack, prepare better attacks. Uh, so the overall result in individually striving for being more secure is that everybody becomes more insecure. And so this is the general structure of the international system that is uh, at, at work all the time. Uh, and in, pr in principle, one possibility to try to to be uh, to to be better able to defend is to have better technological possibilities so at least since 1945 or you could also argue since 1915 or so there is a general technological arms race going on uh, in the uh, countries that have potent armed forces and as a as an aside uh, i'd like to mention that the us for instance, has uh, an explicit policy of t trying to be and remain a technological superior over any potential uh, military adversary. And so the, U the U.S. is kind of going ahead. It spends two-thirds of the global military research and development money. Uh, and other countries that see themselves as potential adversaries of the U.S. try to follow suit and to catch up and so on. So this is the general arms race, technological arms race that is going on all the time. The present arms race is not tied, the technological arms race is not tied to nanotechnology as such, mm -hmm. but as soon as some nanotechnology area promises new effectiveness or new efficiency for military systems, it will be used. At the moment, we have, of course, the same uh, nanometer-structured computer components that we have in the civilian components, uh, civilian world uh, we see in the military. Uh, in preparation are autonomous weapon systems, mm -hmm. where no longer a human by remote control, as in a remote control drone, would say, well, this is a valid target, please uh, send a missile and destroy it but uh, where the computer on board would decide uh, what, that this is a valid mm. target and should be killed or attacked. Uh, and the better uh, the nanotechnology-based computers become, the better the algorithms can become in um, differentiating, you see, between things that are school buses and others that are military trucks, for instance. Mm. And there is uh, nanotechnology applications in the guidance systems of longer-range missiles to make them more precise. So it's rather the military missions mm. that are improving, advancing uh, through nanotechnology uses. In the future, it would be nanotechnology-based materials and aircraft uh, without pilots so that they can fly higher acceleration maneuvers and that they can become much smaller in principle uh, little missiles of whatever ladies' handbag size could be used to attack an aircraft. Uh, normally, you would have to bring 30 kilograms of explosive close to an aircraft, and then you explode the explosive and uh, some shrapnel hits the aircraft. But if the guidance systems of a small missile is exact enough that it finds, let's say, the cockpit hood uh, window and crashes through it and explodes just 50 grams, the pilot will be dead and the electronics will be destroyed. So uh, nanotechnology uh, will enable 
certain new arms races and new technologies uh, that, uh, such as those that uh, I have mentioned, and a particular point where the arms race has not really begun, the technological arms race, is, as I said, new chemical and mm -hmm. biological weapons, because still the Chemical Bi Weapons Convention and the Biological Weapons Convention hold. But because of this gap of a compliance and verification protocol in the Biological Weapons Convention, there is a certain danger that the military attractiveness of new selective agents becomes so great that this prohibition may crumble and may break down uh, uh, in, some, in some whatever, five or ten years. So the international community has a big task ahead to try to prevent that from happening. Thank you for mentioning that, because uh, I think probably the most important question we'd like to ask you is, what do you think the international community could be doing more? How else could we be addressing these issues? Yeah, the, uh, as I said, the, the international system is still anarchic, and states would not normally voluntarily uh, Rest, uh, restrain their military technologies because they have to fear that other states, potential aggressors, would use it. So they need to be. Pre they think they need to be prepared uh, and develop things uh, at the same time, or at least with some with little delay. Uh, so the only possibility to prohibit and prevent uh, dangerous uses of new technologies in the, in the armed forces is by an international negotiation mm -hmm. and ne international agreement, as we have in the chemical weapons area and we, as we have in the biological weapons area. But some areas where nanotechnology help mm -hmm. and make, uh, make military forces or could help make military forces more effective and maybe destabilize the situation, I didn't speak about this problem up to now, uh, there are areas where new, where, where uh, limitations and prohibitions are urgently needed. Mm -hmm. A very decade-old issue is the issue of weapons in outer space. We, we urgently need a weapon ban uh, on weapons in space or weapons that uh, attack targets in space. That's one area where the international community is discussing since decades, unfortunately. Another area which is very burning at the moment is the area of autonomous weapon systems. Mm -hmm. As you may know, uh, there is a convention on certain conventional weapons, yes. uh, which is a framework agreement to, to have certain specific protocols that prohibit specifically certain particularly dangerous conventional weapons. Uh, in the, within this so-called CCW convention, Uh, there is one protocol prohibiting laser blinding weapons agreed upon 1995, mm -hmm. and there have been over the last four years expert meetings in Geneva in, within this convention, this convention uh, to discuss whether autonomous weapon systems, where the computer itself would decide uh, this is a target that needs to be attacked, and uh, I find this a uh, very dangerous development, where such prohibitions or limitations have been discussed. Uh, there are up to now at least 22 countries which argue for a legally binding prohibition of autonomous weapon systems, whereas others find that premature and would rather have the benefit, the military benefit of potentially using autonomous weapon systems in the future. So there is still something to do, but I think in Protocol 6 on banning autonomous weapon systems within that convention on certain conventional weapons is a very urgent issue. Finally, uh, there's the issue of upholding the prohibitions on chemical weapons and on biological weapons. As I said, the Biological Weapons Convention has a big gap in that there is no uh, com compliance and verification protocol included. There is such a thing and even an organization to do the verification the Organization for the Pro Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in mm -hmm. The Hague that has just been in the media because of the investigations that they do over the uh, single-person or two-person attack in Great Britain and over the chemical weapons uses 
in Syria. So we have such a mechanism in the chemical weapons area, but mm -hmm. we don't have it in the biological weapons area. So here is a big gap, and the international community should try to fill that gap and add a compliance and verification protocol to the Bio Biological Weapons Convention. Well, Dr. Oldman, thank you very, very much. This has been very enlightening, and you have certainly given us a lot to think about. Thank you. Oh, thank you.